So here's the thing. Quantum mechanics is an incredibly successful theory when it comes to predicting how our universe behaves. The trouble with this theory though is that it's mind bending to think about. A lot of what it suggests doesn't necessarily match up with what we think is intuitively true about the universe. Welcome to this new series that I'm going to be calling Quantum Mechanics, but quickly, in which we'll be learning about quantum concepts, trying to get a detailed and intuitive understanding of them, but quickly without having to sit in an hour long lecture, for example. Also, you don't need to know any advanced mathematics. In this video, we will be looking at the wave function, which is one of the most commonly discussed ideas and concepts in quantum mechanics. And we'll be looking at where it comes from and what purpose it serves in helping us understand the universe around us. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Also check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support this channel over there. Thanks very much, let's get going. You may have heard of the physicist Louis de Broglie, who suggested something very unusual for his time. While scientists were busy debating whether light was a particle or a wave, de Broglie suggested that even matter, things with mass, could behave like waves. Electrons, protons, atoms, whatever, he believed that they could behave like waves as well. This idea of matter waves permeated into the work of a physicist named Erwin Schrödinger. Yeah, that one. He used the principle of conservation of energy, as well as this idea of matter waves, to come up with the Schrodinger equation. As I've discussed in previous videos, this is the governing equation of the quantum mechanical world. It's the big boy in quantum mechanics. And as we can see here, for a single particle Schrodinger equation, what we've got is the kinetic energy of the particle plus the potential energy of the particle. This is where this idea of conservation of energy comes into the picture. Schrodinger is adding up the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the particle in this equation. But more importantly, this equation also contains the wave function of, say, the particle we happen to be studying. We can solve the Schrodinger equation to work out what the wave function looks like. But here's the key question. What does the wave function actually mean? What does it represent? Well, although the interpretations of quantum mechanics are still a hotly discussed topic, the most commonly accepted interpretation is the Copenhagen interpretation. This one suggests that the wave function of a quantum system, say a quantum particle that we happen to be studying, is very closely linked to the probability distribution of that system. As you may know, quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. It tells us that we can only calculate the probabilities of certain things happening before we make a measurement on our system. And the Copenhagen interpretation specifically tells us that if we take our wave function and we square it, technically we take its square modulus, then this is directly related to the probabilities of various things happening when we make a measurement on our system. Now, this is a bit wishy-washy, so let's look at some actual examples of what I'm talking about. Wave functions can be represented in one of many different ways. So let's first start by looking at a wave function for a particle in a box. Now, what this means is that our particle can move along the horizontal or x-axis, and importantly, it can only move between the walls of the box. If we have a quantum particle in a box, it can have one of many different wave functions, each one of which corresponds to a different energy level. But if we look at the lowest possible energy level, then the wave function of our particle in that box looks something like this. In this case, it's just one half of a sine curve. And like we said earlier, if we square this wave function, then we get a probability distribution. We can work out, for example, the probability of finding a quantum particle between x is equal to two and x is equal to three. This is given by the area under our wave function squared graph. And this is what we mean when we say that the wave function is directly related to a system's probability distribution. In this particular case, we had a wave function written as a function of the position of our particle. And so when we squared it, we found the probability distribution for that particle's position. Specifically, the area underneath the curve between two x positions gave us the likelihood of finding that particle between those two x positions. Another quick example, the probability of finding our particle between x is equal to one and x is equal to two is given by this area here. The interesting thing though, is that this is not the only way to represent a wave function. As we've said earlier, wave functions can be represented in one of many different ways. One such way is to represent it using bracket notation. Now I've discussed bracket notation in a previous video, check it out up here if you haven't seen it already. But all we're doing here is representing the wave function of an electron whose spin we want to measure. For those of you that haven't heard about spin, spin is just a property that a particle can have, kind of like mass or charge. But in this case, a spin of an electron can be measured to be in one of two different states, either spin up or spin down. Again, we don't really care what spin actually means. All we care about is that there are two different possible results for when we make a measurement on our electron. 
Now before we make this measurement on our electron, it's in a superposition, a sort of blend of the two possible experimental results, and that's what this wave function is showing us. It's in this state which contains some amount of spin up and some amount of spin down. This, by the way, is an interesting property of quantum mechanics, or at least of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Before making a measurement, our system is in a superposition, a sort of blend of multiple different states. This idea, and whether or not it actually makes any sense at all, is going to be discussed in a future video, so keep an eye out for that. But again, before making a measurement on our electron, our wave function looks like this. If we now go through the rather complicated mathematical steps that essentially amount to finding the square of our wave function, technically the square modulus, which actually also happens to be the same thing as just taking the numbers in front of each state and squaring them individually, then we find the probabilities of each spin state being found when we make a measurement on our electron. In other words, for this particular electron, we've got a 25% chance of finding it in the spin up state and a 75% chance of finding it in the spin down state. Practically what this means is that if we were to make a million copies, say, of this electron, identical in every single way, and we measured each of their spins, then 25% of those would be in the spin up state and 75% would be in the spin down state. And by the way, we can't just attribute this to each of these systems being slightly different in practice. We've mathematically insisted that each system should be identical, and yet making the same measurement on exactly the same system can potentially give us different results. This is one of the mind-bending ideas of quantum mechanics. Another thing worth noting, by the way, is that I said earlier that wave functions, or at least parts of them, can be imaginary. Say instead for our electron, we had this wave function. If we did exactly the same steps again, finding the square modulus of each number before each spin state, then we would once again get the probabilities of 25% for spin up and 75% for spin down. So, although these imaginary values don't actually affect the probability distribution of our system, they most certainly do affect interference that the wave function can undergo. These imaginary values can contribute to what's known as the phase of our wave function, but we're not going to go into that here. Rest assured though, these effects caused by the phase of the wave function are just as mind-boggling as anything else in quantum mechanics. Anyway, the main takeaway here is this. If we take our wave function and find its square modulus, this gives us direct information about the probability of different experimental results occurring when we make a measurement on our system. And by the way, it's not always related to where we will find some part of the system in space. In the first example, we saw that that was the case. We had a particle in a box, and the wave function gave us different probabilities for finding that particle at certain locations in that box. But this was only true because we wrote our wave function as a function of the position of the particle in the box. In the second example, we calculated the probabilities of different spin states being found when we measured the spin of the electron. Another thing worth noting is that a system's wave function, as we've already said before, is described by the Schrodinger equation. That equation tells us exactly how the wave function looks and how it behaves over time, if it's the time-dependent version of the Schrodinger equation we're dealing with. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, if a system's wave function changes over time, it doesn't have to do this necessarily, but if it does, then it changes smoothly over time. And that change over time, like we said, is determined by the Schrodinger equation. However, as soon as we make a measurement on our system, this wave function changes instantaneously. It's known as a discontinuous change, and it's jarring. It's not determined by the Schrodinger equation. It simply collapses into one possible experimental result, as we've already seen. This collapse of the wave function has produced rather complicated problems for the world of quantum mechanics, but again, not for this video. The important thing is that as soon as we've made a measurement and the wave function has collapsed, it once again begins to follow the Schrodinger equation and evolve smoothly over time. And with all of that being said, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Feel free to hit the bell button if you want to be notified when I upload. I think I'm going to enjoy the challenge of making slightly shorter quantum mechanics videos, trying to convey ideas as clearly as possible without hopefully bringing up too many misconceptions, and also whilst not having to produce an hour-long lecture. So if you'd like to support this channel, then like I said, please do subscribe. And I have a Patreon page as well if you'd like to support me that way. As always, thank you so much for all your lovely comments and your wonderful suggestions. I really always appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you really soon.